Welcome to the first of five lectures of History and Polity of the Church of the Nazarene. In this series, we'll be using the mission statement of the Mid-Atlantic District as a guide for understanding the Church of the Nazarene, especially this idea of being a movement of people. We'll dig into what it means to be Nazarene biblically and historically. We'll look at some of the organizational aspects of the Nazarene Church as well as our ordination process. And in the last lecture, we'll unpack some of the distinctive aspects of our theology. And in the process, I'll be offering some suggestions to possibly tweak some of the wording in our mission statement to more accurately reflect who we are. In each lecture, we'll be using these three questions as our outline. What? What does it mean to be a movement of people? So what? So what? What does it mean to be a Nazarene? And my personal favorite, what if? So let's begin. What does it mean biblically to be a Nazarene? Nazareth, can anything good come from there? This is the town where we get our name from. If someone is from Nazareth, they would be called a Nazarene. So here's a picture of Nazareth, the, the well or the Starbucks back in the day. And it was a little farm village which had about 35 homes. This is what it looks like today. In the Bible, Nazareth is described as the home where Jesus grew up. So he was born in Bethlehem. And after that, he moved to Egypt. And then their family in his childhood moved to Nazareth and his father was a carpenter. In Luke 2 there's a story where 12 year old Jesus and his family they traveled from Nazareth to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And then we pick up Jesus in adulthood where he preaches in the synagogue. In Matthew's Gospel he states that Nazareth was Jesus hometown. In Acts, while Paul was on trial, he was accused of being the ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. Nazareth was in the region of Galilee, north of Judea, on the other side of Samaria. Nazareth to Jerusalem is about 63 miles. A four-day journey in Jesus' day. It's a two-and-a-half-hour drive today. So Samaria would have been considered on the other side of the tracks from Jerusalem. So Nazareth would have been considered on the other side of the other side of the tracks from somebody's perspective in Jerusalem. All the people of Galilee were looked upon with contempt by the people of Judea for these couple reasons. They spoke a cruder dialect. They were less cultivated, and they were more exposed to heathen. Even more, Nazareth was a common term of contempt among the righteous Jews in Judea. That no good son of a Nazarene! What do you think of that? Our church's name, Nazarene, comes from an ancient cuss word. On a more serious note, the name Nazarene symbolizes the toiling, lowly mission of Christ and points to a church where the rich and poor alike would be welcome, where all could accept the message of Christ without the stumbling blocks of overgrown church politics, formality, and without embarrassment over either poverty or wealth. And that's from one of our founders, Phineas F. Brzee. That briefly answers the question, what does it mean to be a Nazarene? kind of means we're named after some misfits, those no-good sons of a Nazarene. That brings us to our next question. So what? So what if we're Nazarene? So what if we're a movement of people named after some misfits? So let's take a look at some examples of Jesus' ministry to explore this idea a little deeper. I'd like to talk to you about a concept in the New Testament called table fellowship. Much of Jesus' ministry before and after the resurrection took place at meals. 
Jesus' practice of eating with outsiders and outcasts was central to his ministry. Jesus' table fellowship made friendship the first priority, not conversion, a likeness, or social standing. Jesus' message was embodied in his table fellowship, using meals as the focal point for social and spiritual reconstruction. This table fellowship defied the expectations and norms of society in three ways. Jesus uses meals to reconfigure who's in and who's out. Here's an example. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the in crowd, well, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners, the out crowd, and eats with them. Another story. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So the first was Jesus uses meals to reconfigure who's in and who's out. The second is that Jesus disregards a person's status during a meal. In this story in Luke 7, Jesus was in the seat of honor at the home of a respected member of the community, and he welcomed a sinner of ill repute at the table and forgave her. This was not only a huge challenge to cultural norms, but was also viewed as a theological heresy. Luke 14, in another story, at another meal, at another important leader's home of the community, in response to how the host selected the seating, Jesus told parables about sitting in the last place and about inviting the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind to the parties. The third way that Jesus' table fellowship defied the expectations and norms of society is that he disregards the purity rituals involved at meals. Things like Sabbath observance, sacred calendar issues, and these ritual purity laws were of highest importance in uh, Jesus' generation, but are simply, they're not on our radar today. In many ways, it's very difficult to understand how Jesus' behaviors, as much as his teaching, were challenging the practices and the beliefs of people who thought of themselves as followers of God. Let's look at two stories. Jesus entered the house of God, and he took the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So here's the first of two examples of Jesus defying the purity rituals. And this story is explicit. According to the rules of the day, Jesus gave unlawful bread to his disciples. The second story is not so obvious. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, and he broke them. And then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. How does this familiar story about the feeding of the 5,000 indicate that Jesus was defying the expectations and norms of his society? What does this have to do with him caring for misfits? So in addition to the miracle of the feeding, it would have been an extraordinary event for all these types of peoples to meet and greet and eat with each other. You certainly would, in that day, known your place in your community who you could sit with and eat with and socialize with, as well as who to avoid. So this gathering broke the purity rules around eating, and it broke down the religious and spiritual barriers as people who normally would not interact were having a meal together. This was hands-on learning for what Jesus had been preaching and teaching about the kingdom of heaven. In summary on this concept of Jesus' table fellowship, I'd like to read this quote. Table fellowship mirrors the landscape of the kingdom. Our decision to eat or not eat with someone reflects our social and spiritual values. Jesus eats with the marginalized, the tax collector and the sinner, the unclean, the waif, the disenfranchised, and the stigmatized. So in the first section of this lecture, we looked at the idea of what it means to be a Nazarene from a biblical perspective. And I shared the idea that being Nazarene 
as being a misfit. So in this section, I'm thinking the answer to, so what, is Jesus especially loved misfits. And his love for misfits seemed to get him into a lot of trouble. So let's answer this last question, what if? For this last section on what if being a Nazarene is being a misfit, I have an idea to present to you that has three types of thinking that Christians often have that I think can impact our views and our practices about ministry to and with misfits. The first view is called boundary thinking. And this line of thinking creates a clear line of who's in and who's out. The circle represents the boundary. Abe is an old saint of the church. He's been here forever, and no one can remember Abe not actually being here. Letitia is new, but she recommitted her life to Christ at the altar after a service. Mabel is also new, but we're not sure if she has accepted Christ. We've not seen her at the altar or heard a testimony, and she has not been baptized. Brian, we're sure about him. He comes from time to time, but he asks too many questions. And then there's Brian's friend Jose. We don't even know we don't even know if he's a citizen of the US, let alone a citizen of the kingdom. So the key question of boundary thinking is am I in or out? Is the person going to heaven? Are they a Christian? And the vision or the goal of ministry is to help people know to know Jesus, but also to know what's considered appropriate ways to get in and appropriate ways to act once you're in. The second type of thinking is process thinking. This type de-emphasizes the in and out a little bit and focuses on two other things, being an insider, which is represented by the center of the circle, and it looks more at growth. So in this illustration, Abe is a Christian, but he's outdated. He continues to hold on to the old ways. Whereas Letitia is growing by leaps and bounds. She's on the worship team. She helps with the team. She is growing like crazy, as is Mabel. Mabel leads a small group, and she helps in the greeter ministry. But Brian, he's drifted even farther away. We talked to him about his friends. He keeps bringing to church and how they need to dress up a little and stop smoking in the parking lot, and we haven't seen him in a while. But the good news is... We found out that Jose is a citizen, he speaks English, and he's actually a minister. But we think he's from a different denomination, and we saw on Facebook that he he voted for a Democrat, so we need to keep an eye on him. The key question in this line of thinking is, am I going the right way? And this is a great question, but it too often focuses more on the correct way of being a Christian in that context, in that church, than actually following Christ. And the vision in this ministry is to teach people to move, to move forward, to keep growing. This last type of thinking is called journey thinking. And in this type of thinking, we realize that the center point isn't static. It's closer in line with being in close proximity to where Jesus is hanging out. It's moving, it's progressing, it's advancing, it's journeying, it's taking a walk. Now the most important question becomes whether one is walking with Christ. So in this illustration, who is closest to Jesus? Somehow, this should resonate with Jesus' primal call. Follow me. And to follow Jesus means to hang out in the places he hung out and with the types of people he hung out with. Misfits. What if Nazarenes were not just misfits? But what if we especially loved misfits? What if we paid attention to those places in our communities and neighborhoods where misfits hung out and we tried to figure out what Jesus was up to? What is a Nazarene? It's a misfit. So what? Jesus especially loved misfits. So what if we especially loved misfits. So compelled by God, we are a movement of misfits who passionately live the story of Jesus Christ. What does this Muppet named Gonzo have to do with anything? Well, I think he could be the official mascot of the Church of Nazarene. 
The great Gonzo is an enthusiastic human cannibal performer. But a continuing storyline in The Muppet Show is the ambiguity of his species. He's like no other. He has feathers, he's not a bird. He has fur, but he's not a mammal, a human, or a recognizable anything. He's a gonzo, a whatever, a misfit. In one of the old movies of the Muppets, he wrestles with how alone he is in the world. There's nobody else like him. But then a spaceship comes to Earth, and the aliens who all resemble gonzo explain that many years ago they lost him, but now welcome him back into the fold. And to make a long story short, Gonzo considers going to space with his long-lost family, but he chooses to stay with the Muppets who simply accept Gonzo for the whatever that Gonzo is. So here's the point of the story. Who are the Gonzos, the misfits in your area of ministry? Who are the disenfranchised ones that Brzee talks about? What does a church look like where gonzos could be welcome, where all could accept the message of Christ without the stumbling blocks of overgrown church politics, formality, and without embarrassment over being a gonzo. Here are the questions for this lecture that we'll be discussing on our next meeting together. Thank you.